we are assembled here on a very sacred occasion the centenary of swami vivekananda's visit to bombay in the course of his paripurajika life throughout india it has created modern indian history more people should know what samaji was and what samaji means to us then we can tackle our problems more easily otherwise they go on multiplying all the time and so today and tomorrow we shall deal with swami vivekananda there are two broad chapters in his life his life and work in india his life and work abroad naturally i shall begin with his life in india but i shall continue with his life abroad today and his life and work in india particularly the work will be tomorrow chronologically also first was in the west then he worked in india but before going to the west he had to prepare himself that chapter is beautiful what we call the formative influences on swami vivekananda what made that young man called narendra become so famous like vivekananda we have millions of young people in india they will derive great inspiration when they study the way narendra became vivekananda narendra would have been like anybody else searching for a job making living a family trying to get some name and fame and dying away but no he became a world moving personality and he attracted people to himself thousands and thousands both in india and abroad and he awakened this nation to the realities of this modern age and gave it strength to face up to the challenges of today swami ji was a student like any one of us any number of college students we have swami ji also was a student but he had certain qualities physical strength a good gymnast singing beautiful voice and then brilliant intellect with this as a college student a great love for truth what is the truth of life i want to know the truth that also was a stain that love of truth took him to ramakrishna by chance he sang a song in some assembly ramakrishna heard that song he was very much attracted by this young person and he noticed that he is the person who will help me to discharge my mission in this world from the very first shri ramakrishna found in this young person the person meant for doing his work in the world ramakrishna had lived a life of intense spiritual sadhanas like a scientist experimenting with his scientific instruments etc and he had discovered great spiritual truths and that attracted people to go to him hundreds began to come to him ordinary people extraordinary people 
great orators, leaders of religious movements like Ashok Chandra Sen. Along with that, a few young people also came to Sri Ramakrishna. It is a great drama that was played in that little room in the Dakshineshwar temple, which today has become an international pilgrimage center. Crowds of people go there, sit for a minute, just to enjoy that atmosphere. So here, Sri Ramakrishna began to train these young disciples that came to him. To the older people, he gave spiritual instruction. You get plenty of it in that book, The Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna, written by M, who himself noted down every word and gave us a remarkable spiritual book, The Gospel of Ramakrishna. But on holidays, only householders could come. But on weekdays, these young people could come. So he gave them a special teaching, molded them into instruments for conveying his message to humanity. About 15 or 16 young people from 14 years up to 21, 22. That is the age group. Among all of them, he pointed it out to Narain as a specially sent individual to do this work, not an ordinary person. In the presence of Narendra and in the presence of Keshap Chandra Sen, Keshap Chandra Sen is a well-known person at the time, Narendra an unknown college boy. Ramakrishna will say, if the light of Saraswati shines one point in Keshap, it shines 18 points in Narendra. Narendra will be upset. He will criticize Sri Ramakrishna. What are you telling? People will call you mad. Who am I? I am a just an unknown boy only. The mother has shown me you are to do great work in the world. In that part of Ramakrishna's life, you find many instances of Sri Ramakrishna considering Narendra as the one to convey his message to the rest of the world. But Swamiji was not easy to convince. He was a rational person. He will question again and again. Not only so, when Ramakrishna claims that he has realized his truth, he will say, it may be your heated brain. There is nothing else in it. That kind of questioning from Vivekananda, Ramakrishna had to stand and he stood it with great satisfaction because he himself said to Narain, Narain, test me as the money changers test their coins. Don't accept whatever I say. Test it. Narain had the capacity to test the most rational, the most critical mind was Narendra. He had assimilated modern, western literature and culture, our own ancient literature and culture. See, he was a very remarkable type of youth. So he spent five years with Sri Ramakrishna to get educated by Ramakrishna in a new field of spiritual life. Normal life is there for which college education, jobs, all these are there. But this is the inner life, man's, human being's inner development and making him or her realize the infinite hidden in the heart of all. This was the great education that Narendra received from Sri Ramakrishna. One day, he was restless for spiritual experience, Narendra. And then Ramakrishna called him, what kind of experience do you want? As usual in our country, he also replied, 
I want to remain immersed in Samadhi all the time. Occasionally coming to body consciousness to take little food to keep this body. Now any guru would have been happy to get this reply, but not Sri Ramakrishna. What a small mind is yours, Ramakrishna told Narendra. What a small mind. Can't you see God with eyes open? He is present only when you close your eyes. That is a remarkable statement. Real Vedanta has come from that time onwards. The Advaita Vedanta, both inside and outside, is only one reality. Brahman is both inside as well as outside. Anta says in the Upanishad, Narayana Sthitaha, Bahiranta Stha, both inside and outside, same Narayana is present. And therefore, not only meditation, but also work is sacred. That is a tremendous teaching which we got from the Gita. We had entirely forgotten it. This time, Sri Ramakrishna came to give us this remarkable message. A life encompassing spirituality, not an isolated spirituality, combining life and religion into one single unified attitude. Now this Swamiji got, and then you will do wonders with this power that you have got from here. You will be like a banyan tree under which thousands will take shelter. These are the words Ramakrishna told Vivekananda at that time. So giving all his responsibilities, all his mission into the hands of Narendra, Ramakrishna quietly passed away in 1886. That is in August 1886. Now the Master has passed away. Fifteen or sixteen young disciples are there. A handful of household devotees also very faithful. They are also there. Nobody else is there. From that period begins this tremendous saga of the Ramakrishna Vivekananda movement, the modern Vedantic movement for the good of all, covering the whole world not this little country only. All these young disciples were school or college students, good intellects. Ramarola in his life of Ramakrishna Vivekananda especially mentions this, that these disciples of Ramakrishna were not fishermen or customs clerk. They were brilliant minds. What a great change you can expect in the world where you have intellect and spirituality combined together. Now that is the story that is unfolding from now onwards. Vivekananda began to think, the master is gone, he has given me this great mission, how to work it out? And what exactly is the nature of that mission? I must discover that that the next chapter in Vivekananda's life, 19, 20 years old at that time, the first thing he did was to go around the whole of India. Let me see the India of today. I have seen the ancient India, its glory in our literature and culture. I have seen its greatness in my master, Sri Ramakrishna, a condensed India. But I want to know what India is today. No spiritual sadhaka has ever undertaken such a step. This is something unique. A guru has given a message, go and sit and meditate somewhere, that is what you do. But no, he wants to see the nature of man and human beings in India and what are their problems and how we can tackle them. He has got a comprehensive philosophy which includes economic, 
സോഷ്യൽ പൊളിറ്റിക്കൽ ആൻഡ് എത്തിക്കൽ മോറൽ ആൻഡ് സ്പിരിച്വൽ ഓൾ ആസ്പെക്ട്സ് നത്തിങ് ഇസ് സെപ്പറേറ്റഡ് ദാറ്റ് ഈസ് കോൾ അദ്വൈത നോൺ ഡുവാലിറ്റി ഇൻ ദ ഉപനിഷസ് ഇൻ വേരിയസ് ലിറ്ററേച്ചർ ആൻഡ് ഹി വിൽ എക്സ്പൗണ്ട് ഇറ്റ് ഏറ്റർ ഓൺ ഇൻ ഇസ് ഇന്ത്യൻ ലെക്ചേഴ്സ് ടുഡേ വി വോണ്ട് ടു മേക്ക് ഇറ്റ് പ്രാക്ടിക്കൽ ഹൗ ടു മേക്ക് ദിസ് വെദാന്ത പ്രാക്ടിക്കൽ ആൻഡ് സോ സ്വാമിജി ഗോസ് റൗണ്ട് ദ ഹോൾ ഓഫ് ഇന്ത്യ ഓൺ ഫുഡ് മോസ്റ്റ്ലി സം ടൈം സംബഡി വിൽ പുട്ട് എ ടിക്കറ്റ് ഇൻ ദ ഹാൻഡ് ഈ വിൽ ഗെറ്റ് ഇൻ ദ ട്രെയിൻ വിത്ത് എ ടിക്കറ്റ് അതർവൈസ് ജസ്റ്റ് വാക്കിംഗ് പരിവ്രാജക ഇ ദ വേൾഡ് പരിവ്രാജക വാണ്ടറിങ് മോങ്ക് ഇറ്റ്സ് എൻ ആൻഷൻ ട്രഡീഷൻ ഇൻ ഇന്ത്യ towards the end of the vedic period several people left their homes lived in the forest as vanaprasthis and from there they will wander from one settlement to another settlement going round and round that is the vanaprastha developing into a paribrajaka very pathetic paribrajaka so is well established an institution at the time of the upanishads but when buddha came it became still more established buddha's followers were all parivrajakas going round bihar up part of delhi part of madhya pradesh in that area buddha's disciples went and his later disciples went even far away to mongolia south east asia alone everywhere but this parivrajaka is a beautiful institution free wandering from place to place teaching people whatever you know getting a little food from people and thus living the freest life that is parivrajaka a little bit of this experience came to the modern world in america during the the moment of the dropouts in america 60s children boys and girls dropping out in colleges we don't want this education is all useless they became hippies the word hippie was coined at that time we don't belong to any society this is a bad society but when i was in america it was at the height one whole hippie group in a big church hall asked me to address them to speak about indian culture there i told you are all hippies you don't like this society you want to live a different type of life but you do not know what that new life is whereas in india we have a tradition from 4000 years when you leave society you enter into a new spiritual life called parivrajaka life we know all about it your difficulty is you know how to drop out you don't know where to drop in and the result was within 10 years that woman fizzled out many became criminals drunkards and a few became spiritually benefited by that moment whereas in india i told in my lecture Buddha was a very Vrajika, they drop out. I am also a drop out. Then they all laughed in the audience. You are a drop out? Yes, I am a drop out. But I knew how to, where to drop in. Therefore, I have no difficulty. So this is India. The Parivrajika life of Swamiji is an extraordinary phenomenon. But its special characteristic is trying to find out how people live. Our scriptures tell us that every human being is divine. That's a high status. But when he went around India, he found men and women living like animals, exploited, crushed by a very heartless society. He found everywhere suffering. He lived with princes and peasants. He lived with untouchables. with muslims with everyone and he watched and his heart broke tremendous sorrow came to his heart what is this human being such a glorious figure 
he has been introduced to this condition, a heartless society. This must change. This must change. That was the conclusion that he arrived at after going around this country as a periprajaka. Just now, India is observing that centenary, the Kanyakumari Vivekananda Kendra started on a Vivekananda Yatra, Bharat Yatra, from Calcutta on January 12th, passing through various places where Swamiji went, and then entered Rajasthan, and now entered Gujarat. They will be here 21st September to 27th September in Bombay, and then continue to southern Maharashtra, Karnataka, and then Kanyagumari in December. So it is a beautiful idea. It is good for us to relive that experience because out of that wandering we got a new message from our own Vedanta, practical Vedanta. And so Swamiji finished all these wanderings. His heart was full of sorrow. Is this the state of human being in my country? So much of poverty, so much of suffering, so much of ignorance, so much of heartlessness of the upper classes, caste-ridden. What is all this? Where is Vedanta? It's teaching that every human being is divine. And where is this India today? This must be changed. With this conviction, he went to Kanyakumari, 22nd December this year, is the time for that. He is the centenary. He meditated on the rock on which you have the great memorial. In that meditation, you find the subject is the state of the human being in our society. Can we not raise him, raise her, make them decent human beings, realize a bit of the glory that is within? Is it necessary to make them remain like this, worse than cattle all the time? This kind of thought was the subject of meditation. And while thinking of this, tears pouring from his eyes with tremendous feeling, a heart of a Buddha you could see in Swamiji on that rock. There he decided, earlier during his travels in Gujarat, some people had put this idea into his head, here nobody will appreciate you in this country. You are one of the wandering sadhus, that is all. Go to the West, they will appreciate your intellect, your wisdom, your knowledge, your experience. That idea had been put into his head. In the course of wandering up to Kanyakumari, that took root, that took a specific form that there is a parliament of religions in Chicago, September 11, 1893. You can be the representative of Hinduism there. But our people are so impractical, we did not send him as a delegate. You must have an association, pass a resolution, we send so and so as a delegate of Hinduism to America. We never did any such thing. Swamiji also never did any such thing. He just made when Ramarola writes beautifully. He said he knew, I have only to go to win. I did not worry further. That feeling was there. Holy Mother also wrote a letter to him that all the show going on there is for you. You go, I bless you. Sharada Devi, that blessing. Ramakrishna also gave a vision to him at that time. So, Madras, young people gathered together, arrangements were made. Finally, he goes to America from Bombay. That's the second time coming to Bombay. Maharaj of Khetri of Rajasthan also helped him. And so, May 31st, 1893, he left Bombay for the West. Ostensibly, to attend the Parliament of Religions. But when he reached there, 
first bank over there, railway, from their railway to Chicago. He found Parliament is still two months later, sometime in September. How to live here? Where is the money? Every day money flows out. Costly life there. He was worried. Then something happened. That something has happened many times in Swamiji's life. As if, today when you look at it, you feel as if some divine drama is taking place, each person being given a part to play in the drama. That you can see in many cases. One such case is coming now. He said, somebody said, go to Boston. It is cheaper to live there these two months. So he said, okay, you shall go there. He also learned that he is not a delegate, so you cannot get admission to parliament. That also he heard. Everything was chilling in a foreign country. Under the British rule we were, there is no free government of India to help, all alone. Only his intellect, his spirituality, his courage, that alone was there to help him and the blessing of Sri Ramakrishna. So he traveled by train to Boston. He was a professor in the train. He was the professor of Greek in Harvard University, Professor Wright. He took interest in him, found a wonderful scholar. So they talked all the way. He said, you be my guest in Boston. All the better, I have no place to go. So he became a guest there. Talks went on. He was so impressed by Swamiji's brilliance, broad views, he asked him, why don't you represent Hinduism as a parliament of religions? I do want to represent, but they said, I have no credentials, I have no credentials, Swamiji said. Then, Professor Wright made a famous remark, it is there in the life of Vivekananda, to ask you for your credentials is like asking the sun its right to shine. He did not merely say in words. He took pen and paper, wrote a letter recommending Swamiji to the Parliament of Religions Committee. In that letter, you find one sentence. Here is a man more learned than all our learned professors put together. That is the impression Swamiji created on Professor Wright. He and his wife remained Swamiji's friend up to the end of their life. So much. So, later Swamiji started back to Chicago. Where to stay in Chicago? He doesn't know. So, the train came too early in the morning, I mean in the evening, no place to go where to spend the night. A box was lying there in the railway yard for goods. He entered that box and slept there, just like in India. Just imagine, a day later, he is going to, to what you call, electrify the whole world by his speech. But the previous day, he is absolutely a beggar, lying quietly, unknown, in a small box, railway box. So morning, got up, became very hungry, started begging here and there. Begging is not allowed in America. They insulted him, get out, get out from here, go, like that. Then comes again a second drama, divine drama. He sat on the roadside under a tree. One lady from across, looked and found a strange type of person. She was attracted to go to him to ask him who is he. That was Mrs. George W. Hale, the Hale family, Swamiji's eternal friends, they remain thereafter. She came, are you a delegate to the Parliament of Religions? Yes, I have forgotten the way, I don't know anything. She took him into the house gave a bath, dress, food, everything, and drove him to the Parliament of Religions where they had arrangement for the 
delegates to stay. This one lady and her husband and children, they became Swamiji's eternal friend. It is as if God has appointed them to play this part. Had yet appointed, you have the right to play that part. Many more such cases will come later on. Now comes the Parliament of Religions. The house in which he stayed, the granddaughter of that owner of the house has written her reminiscences of Vivekananda in her house. Most beautiful, very inspiring. She was a girl of five or six at that time. Some used to play with her and talk to her about India and all that. I also met her in Chicago. I heard her lecture, my reminiscences of Swamiji. There you get a wonderful picture of Swami Vivekananda. What impression he creates on anyone with whom he comes in contact. There is actually a book, Reminiscences of Vivekananda, by Eastern and Western people. It is worth reading. How greatness is so compelling. In spite of you, you are attracted. A college girl hears a Vivekananda who was in Chicago, he is coming to my town to speak. She became excited. Then she, 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 she will come to my college also to speak, becomes more excited. No, he will stay next room, became still more excited. And she writes her reminiscences. I have forgotten what all he said, but his personality, I can never forget. Such things you will get in that book. So now, Parliament started. It was meant to be a Parliament of Religions. Thousands of delegates from all over the world have come. Swamiji had no delegation, but Wright's letter got him the opportunity to be included as a delegate. Everybody sat, huge hall, and there Parliament began. First, welcome to the delegates, and the delegates replied to that welcome. Swami was asked, from morning onwards by the President, Dr. Barrows, you speak. He has never spoken before. He had once spoken in Hyderabad just in February before going to America. Otherwise, he was not a speaker. He said, not now, not now, not now. Morning over, afternoon came, nearly 4 p.m., now or never. Then Swamiji said, okay, I shall speak. Then he stood before the podium, just looking around the whole audience with a prayer to God of Saraswati in his heart, he addressed the whole audience as sisters and brothers of America. It was like a magic. The whole audience started clapping, clapping, clapping for two minutes. They have never heard this kind of tea, that they are all sisters and brothers. He spoke from the heart. He spoke from the heart of Indian culture. Others only spoke of ladies and gentlemen in the usual way. After two minutes, first he thought, I have committed a blunder. People have become excited. Then he understood. He has entered into their hearts. Then for five minutes, a brief speech replied to the welcome to the delegates. That is the speech. Every child in India must memorize that speech. Just a para. Sisters and brothers of America, it fills my heart with joy unspeakable to respond to the welcome that is given to us. I come from a country which has taught the world tolerance, and universal acceptance. We have in our bosom all religions, early Christians, Parsis, all who came as refugees, India welcomed them. That is the religion to which I belong. I am representing that here. Then he quoted the Gita Shloka. Ye from through whatever paths men come unto me, 
I received them through those very parts. And in the end he said, there is so much persecution, intolerance, violence in the name of religion. But I am hoping that the bell that tolled in honor of this convention this morning shall be the death knell of all such persecution in the name of religion. Let us hope so. That is the first lecture that was enough. He had captured the American mind and heart thereby because the best minds and hearts were in the audience. And through newspaper reports, glowing reports, the rest of America also came to know this. Vivekananda was undoubtedly the greatest figure in the parliament of religions. After hearing him, we consider how foolish it is to send missionaries to this learned nation. It is better they send missionaries to us than we to them. One newspaper wrote like this. All the papers were of this nature, full of praise, but the bigoted Christian missionaries, they never liked it. They tried to blacken him all through. Throughout his four years life in America, even later coming to India, this blackening process continued. Today's Christians are ashamed of it. But at that time, such fanaticism was there, such narrowness was there. India is only a land of heathens. There is absolutely no culture. That is how they taught the American people that Hindu women throw their children to feed the crocodiles in the Ganges. Such books are written for children's education in American schools. You can see them in some of the recent books you will find. So Swamiji showed India in a new light. This is the great country. Then he read a paper on Hinduism. Another day he spoke on Buddhism. So many times he was called upon to speak. And one particular event is when one speaker is speaking, rather prosaic audience begins to leave. Then immediately the president will get up. At the end, Vivekananda will speak a few words and all will sit down. And the papers wrote, the chairman knew how to keep the best audience together by mentioning Vivekananda's name, that is all. So, from 11 September to 27 September, series of sessions, he spoke. All of them you get the complete works of Vivekananda, volume one, the beginning itself, Chicago addresses. One paper on Hinduism, the profoundest truth that he uttered there, which fell like a bombshell in the Christian world in America at the time, was quoting from Shweta Shwetara Upanishad, addressing all humanity as children of immortality, not children of sin. It is a sin to call a man so. It is a standing libel on human nature. Call up the divine that is within. This is the way India presents the nature of the human being. In the West they are taught you are all born sinners. The only way is to believe that Jesus' blood will save you. That is the sum and substance of that religion. And this is the first time they were hearing this great message from the Upanishads that, I'm quoting that famous shloka, Srinvandu Vishve Amritasya Putra Aye Dhamani Divyani Tastahu Vedaha Metam Purusham Mahantam Aditya Varnam Tamasaparastat Tamev Viditva Adimurti Mete Nanya Pantha Vidyate Ayanaya Hear me, ye children of immortality, all over the world, the message is not confined to India or to Hindu. Vishwe, Srinvandu, let the whole world listen. I have a great message to convey to you, even to the gods and angels in heaven. Let them also listen. That is the first sentence. Where from you got this message? From books. From here say, no. Vedahametam. I have known it. I have realized it. Vedahametam. What is the truth? Purusham Mahantam. The infinite man behind the finite man. 
physically we look finite, limited, truncated, but within us is an infinite dimension. The infinite Atman shines in every one of us. That is the great teaching of Vedanta. So Purusham Mahantam, Aditya Varnam, luminous like the sun, Tamasat Parastat, beyond all darkness and delusion. And the Upanishad did not stop there. Believe me that you have the divine within, then you will be saved. Upanishad did not say. Try to realize it for yourself. Believing in somebody else is not going to save you. So, tameva viditva atimurti meti nanya antha vidyate ayanaya. Realizing this truth hidden within you, then alone you can save yourself from death and delusion. There is no other way. There is no other way. Nanya pantha. No other way. No other way. Realize this truth. Swamiji spoke this language. It was like a bombshell on that audience. The first Vedantic bombshell, I call it. Creating thinking. What is this? Today's science speaks of human uniqueness. Sir Julian Huxley, biologist, has written a book called Human Uniqueness, Uniqueness of Man. Man is unique in more ways than one, he has said there. At that time, it was not there. Man is a sinner, absolutely down and out. That's all. Only believe in a particular dogma, then you'll be saved. The whole thing was turned upside down. Everybody wants to hear this message. America itself is a land of freedom. Americans believe in themselves. They don't believe they are sinners. Fortunately, they don't believe. Therefore, they could develop their nation. So, this message was carried all over America, rest of the world. Sometime later, it came to India also. This gave the opportunity to Swamiji to enter into the heart and mind of the American people. Invitations came from various towns and cities. Like Chicago, the second city in which a tremendous effort was made was Detroit, where these bigoted missionaries tried to spoil Swamiji's name, make people not to come, but thousands came. Not only so, the governor of Michigan gave a reception to Swamiji. All the distinguished people were there. And Detroit is also famous that it gave two devotees to Vedanta, to Swamiji. One is Sister Christine, the other is the second one. Well, close friends. Christine later on came to India, worked in Calcutta for women, etc., etc. There's a later story. So that is the Swamiji's reception. Town after town, town after town, he went to deliver this message of Vedanta. Originally he thought he could raise funds to work for India's uplift. Later on he found that is no use. Let me give something to these people. They are hungry for it. They want to hear this wonderful message of Vedanta. So full of strength and fearlessness, faith in oneself. That is the teaching of Vedanta. We are all one. We are only physically separate. Spiritually we are all one. So throughout America, these things went on. He visited England, the special invitation from there. So many lectures were delivered in England. And a second visit also to England, he went, returned back to America. In England, he got two precious human beings as upholders of Vedanta. One is Mr. and Mrs. Sevier. He was captain of the army, retired. He was in search of truth. He attended Vivekananda's one lecture, crowded lecture. After the lecture, both of them came out. Each said, is this young man truly what he seems to be? The other said, yes. Then we must follow him. We must follow him. And literally they did. 
Swamiji wanted to start an ashrama in the Himalayas. Savior said, I shall do that for you. He sold away all his property, came to India. Today what you call Advaita Ashrama Mayavati is a product of the work of these two great people, Mr. and Mrs. Savior. Savior passed away very early, if, before Swamiji passed away. Mrs. Savior lived much longer. So that is one. Second is one young intellectual lady, Miss Margaret Noble, full of spirit, in search of truth, agnostic, not believing in this current religion that is taught there. So he, she went with here the lecture. She was so impressed. Second time she came to the lecture, she addressed Swamiji as Master. You are my teacher. Suddenly. And from that time onwards, she became a daughter of Vivekananda. She has written a famous book later on when she came to India. Nivedita, sister, what you call Miss Margaret Noble, came to India, later on became Sister Nivedita. Swamiji initiated her. She started school, girls' school, etc. She helped Jayapindu Ghosh. She did so much political service to the people. And when she died, Tagore wrote an article in praise of her that when Nivedita speaks of our India, there is more passion in it than when you and I speak of our India, a foreigner like Nivedita. She is the Loka Mata, the mother of the people. These are all Tagore's words on Sister Nivedita later on. So England gave these two, one couple and this lady, Swamiji, you want to work for Indian women? I am ready. I will come and educate Indian women. Swamiji was very satisfied. Yes, you are the type we need, a lioness. Our society cannot produce such women yet, but we want you now. So come and welcome. And she came to India. A third contribution of England to Swamiji is memorable. When Swamiji was speaking in America after the Parliament of Religions, they were employing stenographers to take the lectures. Most of them could not take lectures properly. He was a fast speaker. They were in search for a good stenographer. A young English boy had come to America for a job to New York, J. J. Goodwill. He offered to do that service. As soon as he was given that job, he could run fast in stenography. As soon as he finished the work, they tried to pay him. No, I don't want any payment. Swami is doing so much work for the world, I will be his servant. From beginning to end, he remained Swamiji's servant, a student and servant. He passed away very early because later on all the English and American lectures, all the Indian lectures about which I shall tell tomorrow, all this is taken by this J. J. Goodwin, one single young English boy, dedicated as it were for this cause. Later on when he came to India, stayed in Madras for some time, came to Uti and he passed away, 98 or 99, he was hardly 28 years old at the time. Swamiji said, my right hand is gone. That was the feeling he had. We have erected a memorial in Uti where he is buried. It took some time to find out where he is buried. Being a poor man, no name is there. So he consulted all the church books and found Yes, J. J. Goodwin, St. Thomas Churchyard. So we took permission from the Archbishop, Calcutta, who was a friend of mine, then the Bishop of Coimbatore, and about three, four hundred people joined together. A beautiful memorial where his birth, his death, and Swamiji's poem on him, all that is written there. Anybody who goes to Uti can see it. When you go from the race course through the road, to the 
Maharaja Palace, Mysore Maharaja Palace, on the way, he falls. So this is the story. Now, in America, Swamiji also published books on Vedanta, Jnana Yoga, Raja Yoga, Bhakti Yoga, Karma Yoga. All these Jnana Yoga is mostly lectures, Karma Yoga is class talks and writing, Raja Yoga is dictation and taken by Miss Waldo, Emerson's uh, granddaughter, you can say. So, so many people came together to help Swamiji in the work in America. In the midst of all this very busy schedule of work, he wrote series of letters to India, to workers in this country, to inspire them to create a new India. Those letters are highly inspiring. Tomorrow I shall be telling that among the two books that every youth must read if he or she is to make life really meaningful, purposeful, and not empty, it is these two. Lectures from Colombo to Almora, that is lectures in India, and the other is letters of Vivekananda, especially from 1893 onwards, up to 1893, ordinary letters. Inspiring letters come from 1893 onwards up to 1902, and he passed away. Now these are the two books that created patriots who joined to fight for freedom. Highly inspiring literature. But after independence, people forgot all about it. That's why we are down and down and down, not going up and up. Something is missing in India. That will come tomorrow. So this literature, for yogas, all these books, good sale, people want to read more, questions, answers going on, Swamiji did, four years of work, the best part of his life in America and England, the best part of his life. He knew that the world is hungry for this great thought of India. Earlier, ancient Greeks had turned to India to learn our philosophy. On the Upanishads, so much went to Greece. One writer speaks of Plato being highly influenced by the Upanishads. So, there's an old tradition, Indian thought, going to the rest of the world silently, quietly, without any violence, without any army. India has never gone out to conquer any country during 5,000 years history. Swamiji repeated it again and again. India's contribution to the world is spirituality. It has, it has done it throughout the ages. And in this age, it is going to do in a big way. And the Western people are asking for it. We are not trusting it on them. This is the only message for which India doesn't spend a pie to spread around the world. The receivers pay for it. What must be the nature of that message? Just imagine, in any other religion to convert one person means 20,000 rupees to purchase his, his soul. But not so Vedanta. I have traveled 15 years around the world. All they paid for it. Not only that, they will pay some more as an offering of devotion. Because this is a profound philosophy, they understand it. It can no one can stand challenge of modern science. And so scientists also like this philosophy, that teaching of the infinite nature of man. In one single sentence, tattumasi, tattumasi, you are that, you are that. You are not this truncated physical frame. You are that infinite one. That is Chandu Upanishad. How many scientists quote this wonderful line, Tattumasi, Tattumasi, you are that, you are that. Today, all over the world, South America, North America, and now the whole of Russia is simply mad to get a little bit of this literature, even a photo of Ramakrishna or Vivekananda, they are not able to get it easily. 
and most of the books are in English, a few in French, some few in German. Very old times they are published in Russian also. So now there is a real search. Swamiji, when he was in England, he met two great professors, Professor Max Muller, one who popularized Pradveda in the English translation. He wrote a book on Ramakrishna, first an article, Ramakrishna, a real Mahatma. Second, a book, Life and Sayings of Ramakrishna, from information gathered from Swamiji and others. That is 99. Ramakrishna passed away 86. In 13 years, a life has come in London on Ramakrishna. The other is Doyson, Professor Doyson of Germany, great lover of India, Sanskrit scholar. He could lecture in Sanskrit. And that Doyson has written a book, Vedanta Philosophy. He was in Bombay, 1892, after his visit in India. A farewell meeting, he gave a farewell talk to the people of India. You have a great culture, you have a great philosophy, don't forget it, hold on to it, I request you. Then he said, the Bible teaches, love thy neighbor as thyself. But why should I do so? There's no answer in the Bible. Answer is in the Upanishads, because you and your neighbor are one. We are essentially one, the same Atman in every being. That is the teaching that is there. This is what Doyson said at that time. Now here you have the wonderful impression made on a German professor and an English German professor in England. Max Muller is actually a German. And many in intellectuals and others as well. That was the time Swamiji felt, after four years, I must go back to India. So many letters went to him. When are you returning? All the time in the West, we want you more here, we want you more here. And he used to reply. In one reply, you find a beautiful sentiment. It says, I am here among the people who love what I teach. I shall certainly come to India. I love India. But what is India, England or America to us? We who believe that you call man, but actually he is God in disguise. I serve him here or there. That's what I am doing here. Like that he wrote. Finally, he decided it is time to come to India. So 1897, January, he left England to come to India. And then the drama that took place in India at that time has been so beautifully described by Monsieur Ramarola when he read about Vivekananda and Ramakrishna. He was fascinated. Tagore also met him at that time. So when he found him interested in India, Tagore told him, if you want to understand India, study Vivekananda. In him, everything is positive, nothing is negative. That inspired him. That brought him to study the literature, all in English. He doesn't know English. He didn't know. His sister knew English. Sister will translate into French. And then he wrote that book, and the best critical, appreciative books on Ramakrishna, Vivekananda, you get in these two volumes, Life of Ramakrishna, Life of Vivekananda. That is the later development. But later on, one more book has come from Isherwood, the English writer in America. He has also written Ramakrishna, a great phenomenon. So Western writers are writing. Now many books are coming now. We are now concerned that this Vedanta, this Ramakrishna's message, is meant for the whole world, not for India only. But India must be strong and steady to be able to deliver that message. How to reshape that India? That is the work Swamiji did. And the best 
critical, appreciative books on Ramakrishna, Vivekananda, you get in these two volumes, Life of Ramakrishna, Life of Vivekananda. That is the later development. But later on, one more book has come from Isherwood, the English writer in America. He has also written Ramakrishna, a great phenomenon. So Western writers are writing. Now many books are coming now. We are now concerned that this Vedanta, this Ramakrishna's message, is meant for the whole world, not for India only. But India must be strong and steady to be able to deliver that message. How to reshape that India? That is the work Swamiji did on his return from his four years work in the West, landing at Colombo in January 1897. That subject we shall take up tomorrow. It is a fascinating subject, inspiring subject. How many people in India are missing reading this literature? Something great will come to them. All that is petty and small will change. A bigger man will come out of the smaller man. Today we are so many petty small men and women. I call it, we are in a big country, but small people. Small people in a big country, full of pettiness, full of violence. All these things are there. Those things will change when they get education in Vivekananda literature. His words are great music. Let me now alone quote from Arola's remark about Vivekananda literature. Vivekananda's words are great music. They are like Beethoven's symphonies. They are like the stirring rhythms of the march of Handel choruses. I cannot touch these words of Vivekananda separated in books of 30 years distance without getting a thrill through my body as an electric shock. And what shocks and transports must have been produced on the people who actually heard them. This is what a foreigner writes about Vivekananda literature. Our people need to be shocked out of all these pettiness and complacencies today. He read the literature for that purpose. So tomorrow we shall deal with that part of Vivekananda's drama, that act in India, how he came, how he was received, what message he gave. All these things will come as a subject tomorrow. So now, thank you all. Namaskar. I spoke of Swami Vivekananda's work in the West and introduced his coming back to India in January 1897. But I wish to mention two more personalities who did immense help to Swamiji and to our country. First is Miss Josephine McLeod, very high level lady in England, connected with America also, who did immense help to Swamiji's work in his lifetime and thereafter till she passed away in 1949. The second is Mrs. Ole Bull. She was in Cambridge, next to Boston. Her husband was a great violinist of Norway. She did immense services to fulfill Swamiji's work 
in the West as well as in India. In fact, she is the one who paid money to purchase the land at the Belur Mat headquarters. Our country was asleep at that time. I'm glad to announce that an American sannyasini of the Sharda Mat, Prabhrajika Prabhuddha Prana, has written a beautiful life of Miss Josephine McLeod. Hardly last year, I couldn't stop reading it. In two days, I finished the whole book. She is now writing a life of Mrs. Ole Bull also. For this, she had been to America, she had been to Norway. That book also will come soon. Apart from this, there are six volumes written by an American lady of San Francisco, Mrs. Mary Louis Burke. Volumes are Swamiji from Vekanda in America, New Discoveries. From that book you will know the impact of Swamiji on varieties of minds, common people, uncommon people, scientists, thinkers, all that you will get in that. That book is a book of a research, going from place to place, house to house, discovering new materials about Swamiji in some private house or an advertisement, a walking stick or anything like that. She did a lot of research and produced this book. She comes to India almost every year. Now, before I refer to Swamiji's work in India, I want to make a small correction, factual correction. I had said yesterday that from Chicago, finding that the Parliament of Williams will be only in September, and Chicago is costly, he was going to Boston. Yesterday I said he went to Boston with Professor Wright. That's not correct. He went to Boston with one lady by name Sanborn. Miss Sanborn. She had no interest in Vedanta. She found Swamiji as a curio. So she invited him to stay with her, to introduce her as a curio, introduce him as a curio to her distinguished guest. Our one of that guests was Dr. Wright, who gave Swamiji introduction to the parliament, which came yesterday's lecture. Swamiji writes about it. She wanted to present me as a curio. I also accepted because I could save my dollars. That's what he said. He writes in one letter. Now that is subject of yesterday. Today, Swamiji is returned to India. Earlier we studied his wanderings all over India, living with peasants, princes, high class, low class, Hindu, Muslim, all trying to know India intimately. You could see the pulse, very weak pulse. The whole nation is down, asleep as it were. And the upper levels, perfectly heartless, absolutely no heart. That kind of thing is saw. How humanity has been reduced to a low level of life by the heartlessness of the holders of power in our society. Now, coming back to India, people had been excited in India through the newspaper reports here about his success in America. They were all expecting. Every town he passed through, crowds used to come, welcome, speech, and then the t next station like that. So he finished Colombo first, a very big reception, 
and the first public lecture in the East, you will find that Colombo lecture titled, Then under Adhapara, Jatna, crossed over Pamban and Rameshwaram, then Ramnad. Ramnad, the Raja was there. The first important lecture you get in Ramnad in reply to the welcome. All were expecting a tremendous message, young and old, including the prince. The first opening para of that lecture is highly prophetic. Remember, we were under the British subjection. We were perfectly happy with that subjection if you could get 30 rupees clerkship. That was our condition at that time. But Swamiji saw that this is only temporary. Great things are going to happen. That is expressed in the opening para. The longest night seems to be passing away. The sorest trouble seems to be coming to an end at last. The seeming corpse appears to be awaking. India, this motherland of ours, from her deep, long sleep. None can resist her anymore. Never is she going to sleep anymore. No outward powers can hold her back anymore. For the infinite giant he is rising to her feet. What a wonderful vision. A giant of India, sleeping, people coming, tying us hand and feet at that time. And now, the period of awakening. Swamiji is a great awakener of souls. The whole India, he awakened. From now onwards, up to the end of the series of lectures, you will find this note, India awake. And when it is awake, tremendous energy will come, power will come. And we shall channel all these energies and powers only for the good of humanity, never to harm anybody. That he repeated again and again. So from Ramnad, passed over to other towns in Tamil Nadu, like Paramakudi, Kumbakona, Madurai, finally came to Madras. Madras has the distinction of producing one young man at that time, housing the Perma, who saw Swamiji, he appreciated Swamiji's ideas, he became his disciple and he became the conduit through which Swamiji passed his ideas to the people when he was in the West. Alasinga is an extraordinary devoted person. Many of the finest letters of Swamiji are written to him dealing with our national problems. Now a large number of young people are joined together along with Alasinga and he it was who suggested Swamiji should go to the West. Now he has come, returned back, and he is a welcome. And Madras welcome was extraordinary. If you read the Hindu of those days, 1897, you will see 17 arches all over the town with various slogans written there. Welcome to the hero of Chicago like that various things written there. And in the midst of all this tremendous intellectual and spiritual ferment, Swamiji gave five great lectures in Madras. They are masterpieces, both in language, diction, ideas. The first lecture, title itself is remarkable, with all this enthusiasm of the people, how to channelize this enthusiasm to national development, national welfare, nation making. And so, the first title is My Plan of Campaign, like, like a Napoleon planning a campaign. That is the first lecture, My Plan of Campaign. 
Then comes Vedanta and its application to Indian life. Third comes the work before us. What are the great problems that we have to face in the nation? Then comes the sages of India. Another masterly lecture coming from the Upanishads up to Ramakrishna. A beautiful presentation of the great sages and incarnations who have adorned the horizon of India. And lastly comes that wonderful lecture, The Future of India. In these lectures, Swamiji pointed out how narrow our minds had become, how contracted our life has become, almost to die. Too much contraction means death, expansion means life. We were in a contracted mind as it were. And then this caused exclusiveness, this untouchability and neglect of women, treated as good-for-nothing people. Our women have suffered for these 2,000 years from all the books written to govern social life. In all of them, you will find only the rights of men and the duties of women. There are no rights, only duties. Rights all belong to men only. Up to date, almost all the books contain only this kind of thing, and they have no education. Even a Brahmana's wife cannot utter the word oh. They were deprived of all facilities. This kind of evil descended upon the nation. Humanity's humanness was completely eradic eradicated. Swamiji pointed out to all this, this narrow mind must go. Broad issues are there. The whole world is there. You have to work together with the rest of the world. You have to change all this. There he spoke of the need to work hard, work hard. There is too much of talk in India. Talk, talk, talk. Talk less, work more, and feel more. Feel from the heart, then power will come. All these wonderful ideas you get in all these lectures. In one place, we have caste aristocracy, money aristocracy and pedigree aristocracy, all these in India. And they have been, to call, working heavily to put people down these centuries together. A most revolutionary sentence occurs in that lecture, Future of India. The duty of every aristocracy is to dig its own grave. The sooner it does so, the better. The more it will delay, the more it will fester, and the worse death it will die. What a language, 1897. Marxism and other things, nobody had heard in India at that time. But here is a person who is speaking about awakening of humanity. Those common people, millions of them, living like animals, we have to raise them. The whole thing has to be changed. He uses the word revolution. A revolutionary change is needed in India, in our society. Our teachings are great. Our Upanishads and Gita speak highly of the divinity of the human being. But we treat the human being worse than animals. This contradiction must go. In one letter he had written from America to India, no religion on earth preaches the dignity of humanity in such a lofty strain as Hinduism, and no religion on earth treads upon the necks of the poor and the low in such a fashion as Hinduism. Both we are doing. Man is the Atman, the immortal self, that is the true nature of man. But we just treat him worse than cattle, worse than animal. Now all these things you will find in this wonderful literature. 
and as for religion, simply it became just a few rituals and ceremonies without any heart in it, without any spiritual benefit out of it, without developing character out of it. That kind of religion also lost all relevance in the modern period. And the priests were trying to put more and more bonds on the hands of the people, as against which Swamiji wrote from Japan on the way to America, kick out the priests who are against progress. They will never mend. What we want is an infinite heart, compassion for all that hum humanity, humanism, must come to us in a big way. And then comes a famous passage in that lecture on future of India. It is full of energy, this particular subject. Says here, there is. For the next, so give up being a slave. Don't be slavish, he says. Give up being a slave. For the next 50 years, this alone shall be our keynote, this our great mother India. Let all other vain gods disappear for the time from our minds. This is the only god that is awake. Our own race, everywhere is hands, everywhere is feet, everywhere is ears. He covers everything. That is the famous Sarvata Pani Padam Tat Sarvata Utkrisha In the Gita you find God as a Virat Sarupa manifested to the universe. That is the Vedantic teaching. That here you can see God present, living God. We neglect them. We have destroyed God in this form. So he says, this is the Virat that we have to worship. All other gods are sleeping. What vain gods shall we go after and yet cannot worship the God that we see all around us, the Virat Sarupa. We cannot worship this Virat. We go to a temple, weep before the God there, come here and cheat a human being here. We never had happy relations between human beings. Our God is only in the temple in nowhere else. Swami is referring to that. Here is the Virat Sarupa. We neglected. God there. This is based on the beautiful words from the Srimad Bhagavatam that reference is coming here. It says, when we have worshipped this, we shall be able to worship all our gods. Before we can crawl half a mile, we want to cross the ocean like Hanuman. It cannot be. Everyone going to be a yogi, everyone going to meditate, it cannot be. The whole day, mixing with the world, with karma kanda, ritualistic section, and the evening, sitting down and blowing through your nose, doing some pranayama. This is all a religion. The entire human aspect is forgotten, is neglected. This is blowing through your nose, is the language is used here. Is it so easy? Should rishis come flying through the air because you have blown three times through the nose? Is it a joke? It is all nonsense with the language. Man with authority who speaks, it is all nonsense. What we needed, what we need is chitta shuddhi, purity of the mind, purity of heart. And how does it come? The first of all worship, be the worship of the Virat. The next man in front of you, the neighbor, the other, they are the people who have to honor and worship, cooperate and work together. That is the first thing. All those who are around us, worship it. Not merely serve, but worship it in the language. Then comes, worship is the exact equivalent of the Sanskrit word, and no other English word will do. This comes from the Srimad Bhagavatam, Tritiya Skantham, where Kapila gives spiritual advice to his mother, Devahuti. Kapila was an incarnation of the Divine. 
in that advice comes mother i am not pleased with people spending an arm of money to worship me in some images while insulting me in all the human beings around i am in all of them i don't like that kind of worship but worship me in all beings worship is the word what that word arhaye archaye archana arhana is called worship when service is done with reverence it becomes worship what a beautiful idea but how to worship god in man you can't go to the street and say stop i want to worship you do an aarati you can't do that but the lord says dana mana dhya to rule of felt needs and respecting him while serving him doing don't look down upon him dana mana dhya and maitriya through friendship abhinnena chakshusha attitude of non separateness we are all one we are all one with this attitude worship me in all beings the word swami ji said therefore he is worship arhaye archaye not merely sevaye seva only ordinary service so worship is the exact equivalent of the sanskrit word and no other english word will do these are all our gods men and women our own countrymen is there and animals also all of them says these are to be worshiped all these around us then these we have to worship instead of being jealous of each other and fighting each other we are being constantly jealous of each other jealousy is a characteristic of a slave slaves alone are jealous why that man gets better than me that only slavish minds develop jealousy so swami ji has written jealousy and slavery are the obverse and reverse of the same coin so give up being a slave he started this passage and so here he says these are the countrymen whom we have to worship the first gods whom we have to worship instead of being jealous of each other and fighting each other we are the most litigious people in the whole world i have traveled around the world i have never seen so much of litigation as we see in this country for everything litigation because we have no faith in man our faith is in that idol in the temple nowhere else the whole thing has to change some is preference is coming to that particular subject it is the most terrible karma for which we are suffering and yet it does not open our eyes it is time to open our eyes now this passage is very famous this idea of seeing god in every human being respect and worship and service the stress is on service with reverence so that becomes worship not throwing a paisa like a feudal type of society charity go to a temple after worshiping you see a poor man there throw a paisa towards him and you go away you didn't care for him at all no respect for him that is not what we need we must respect even the poorest of the poor the divine is there today we are in democracy everybody has a value unit value so swami ji spoke at that time this wonderful democracy that is to come later where we can have that relationship between one human being and the other in a spirit of equality mutual respect and cooperation service is the key word in one passage he has said renunciation and service are the twin ideals of india intensify her in those channels the rest will take care of itself tyaga seva without a little tyaga you can't do any seva if you want to show a man which is that house you have to go out to the way to show that house that is sacrifice you have to do without a little tyaga real seva cannot be done so this tyaga this little eye so that the larger eye may manifest 
I am one with you. That spiritual development must come the people concerned. Now these are the various lectures in Madras, very powerful language. Even today when you read, they look so fresh. Jawaharlal Nehru said when he spoke about these lectures, they look so fresh even today. After so many years, that is right, it comes in the mouth of a great sage, of a rishi. And therefore, Swamiji created a tremendous impression in Madras and later on, through these lectures coming out in book form, inspired many, many people to join the fight for freedom. Many of the freedom fighters were inspired by Swami Vivekananda. They themselves have said it, and Mahatma Gandhi has said in a speech at Belur Mat when he came there, I have not come to preach Satyagraha here. I have come to the place where the great Vivekananda lived. I want to take something of that inspiration. And I want all of you also to take some inspiration from here. I have studied his books carefully. After studying them, my love for India has become thousandfold in the language. If all of us can develop 1% love for the nation, we can solve our problem. There is no love for the nation at all. Love only for oneself, 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 especially after independence. And therefore, this wonderful idea, literature of strength, literature of man-making and nation-building, as he calls it, this is what you find. And his words against untouchability is tremendous. He spoke of Kerala at that time, where not only untouchability was there, unseeability also was there. Some sections cannot be seen even. If you see them, you must take a bath. That's called unseeability. Swamiji saw this madness and said, the whole Kerala is a madhouse. All lunatics, this language he has used. And today, Kerala is completely free from all types of untouchability. People have risen to the highest level through education, exactly the way Swamiji wanted. You will find it happening there. So, untouchability, caste exclusiveness, pride, I am a Brahmin, I am this and that. Sri Ramakrishna did many sadhanas. One sadhana is unique. Nobody else has done it. Coming from a clean Brahmin family, he used to go to the latrine of the Pareya, next to Dakshineshwar temple at midnight and clean it, praying, Mother, remove the pride in me that I am a Brahmana, I am a superior caste. Make me the servant of all, make me the servant of all. That one sadhana has a tremendous significance for our country today. We are so full of these petty, petty ideas of status, superiority, that democracy can never come to us. Political democracy must become social democracy. That cannot come without this kind of change of attitude. So from Madras, he goes to Calcutta, his own native place. Big reception was there. Two, three lectures were delivered there. Then Almora then goes to Lahore. In Lahore, big reception. Iris Samaj and many other institutions combined together, gave a tremendous reception. Among the three lectures, one lecture is famous, about two hours lecture on Vedanta. Big gathering was there. Swami Ramatirutha was a professor at that time. He helped to organize that lecture. In that lecture, you find and the inspiring utterance coming to us. He says, therefore, young men of Lahore, raise once more that mighty banner of Advaita, non-duality, non-separateness, that we are all one. For on no other ground can you have that wonderful love until you will see 
that the same Lord is present everywhere. Samam Pashyan hi Sarvatra, Samavasthita Nishwaram, this is there negated. The same Ishwara present everywhere. Realize that truth, says Krishna in the Gita. Unfurl that banner of love. Arise, awake, and stop not till the goal is reached. Arise, arise once more, for nothing can be done without renunciation. If you want to help others, your little self must go. In the words of the Christians, you cannot serve God and Mammon at the same time. Have I Ragya. Your ancestors gave up the world for doing great things. At the present time, there are men who give up the world to help their own salvation. Throw away everything, even your own salvation, and go and help others. Oh, you are always talking bold words, but here is practical Vedanta before you. Give up this little life of yours. What matters it if you die of starvation? You and I, and thousands like us, so long as this nation lives, the nation is sinking. The curse of unnumbered millions is on our heads. Those to whom we have been giving ditch water to drink, when they have been dying of thirst, while the perennial roar of water was flowing past. See that unnumbered millions. The unnumbered millions whom we have allowed to starve in the sight of plenty. The unnumbered millions to whom we have talked of Advaita and who have hate, we have hated with all our strength. The unnumbered millions for whom we have invented the doctrine of Lokachara. Yes, this untouchability is a Lokachara, we must observe it. That's how we justify it, Lokachara. To whom we have talked theoretically that we are all the same and are all one with the same Lord without even an ounce of practice. Yet, my friends, it must be only in the mind, never in practice. If you ask pundits, if you ask priests, this is the language they will tell you. Keep Advaita in your mind. Don't practice it. You make distinctions. That must remain. Swami is referring to that. Wipe off this blot. That is the language. Wipe off this blot. Arise and awake. What matters it? If this little life goes, everyone has to die, the saint or the sinner, the rich or the poor, body never remains for anyone. Arise and awake and be perfectly sincere. Our insincerity in India is awful, even today, 1992, Swami's time also, insincerity, absolutely awful it is. What we want is character, that steadiness and character that make a man cling on to a thing like grim death. Tremendous power of conviction. Then we can change this world. A few people with the power of conviction, that's what we need. In these lectures, Swamiji gave these great ideas. He had particularly two sections of our paper in view to awaken them, raise them to the highest. One is women, the other is the common paper. Both have been suppressed for ages. Women's education, common people's education. Through education alone you can raise a nation. Europe became modern when it gave education to its people. That is the period of modern European history. We have yet to become that modern. A few top people educated doesn't make the nation modern. The whole nation must become educated. Then India will be entering fully the modern age. Women's education is absolutely essential. Perfect equality between man and woman. That is the Vedic teaching. That must come to India. He said, a bird cannot fly on one wing. It needs two wings. A society cannot progress when only men are educated and women are not. 
both must be educated. These are the examples he gave at that time. And so he wanted to start a month for women, a nunnery for women. But conditions were not favorable at that time. Educated women are not many, were not many. Sister Nivedita, Sister Christine, and a few others, all of them conducted a girls' school in Calcutta at that time. And the Holy Mother was the inspiration for all of them. Swamiji said, based upon the Holy Mother, we shall have a women's mutt. That desire of Swamiji became realized in 1953, during the centenary of the Holy Mother. And 1959, an independent Sharda Mutt was started in Calcutta to fulfill Swamiji's dream that these nuns will carry this great message of Vedanta to various countries and various parts of India. And it is actually doing today. They are highly developed. Many branches are there, one in foreign countries in Australia, that is Sydney. An Australian girl has joined also as a Brahmacharini. So this is one part of the story. Then he started the mutt, Belur mutt. He continues the great work of Sri Ramakrishna, for which he wanted the original sannyasins to join together, took up a house for 10 rupee rent because it was a haunted house. You could get it cheap. So there, the Ramakrishna Mat started in Calcutta, Baranagor, opposite to Belur Mat. From that, he shifted to Belur Mat later on before Swamiji passed away. Ramakrishna Mat, Ramakrishna Mission, two organizations to serve the people without respect of caste, creed, nationality or anything looking upon them as parts of the divine. That is the purpose. Every type of service, physical, mental, spiritual, service during calamities. Just then, plague broke out in Calcutta. There was a panic in the city. Our workers went under the leadership of Sister Nivedita and helped immensely in pacifying the people and cleaning up various bastis of Calcutta at the beginning. Then famine relief, various other types of relief, which you know already that is going on as a tradition. So Swamiji wanted this kind of service to be the central principle of religion, the spirit of service. Your neighbor is in front of you. You neglect him. And where are you going to search for God? God is in your heart. God is the heart of the other person also. So finding here through meditation and finding there through seva, let these two go together. This is the Gita teaching that Krishna said, Maam Anusmara Yudhya Meditate upon me inside, carry on the battle of life outside. This is the Gita teaching. Swamiji said, the best book on practical Vedanta is the Bhagavad Gita. But we never lived the Bhagavad Gita teaching. We only honored it, respected it, never practiced it. The time has come to make Gita practical in every aspect of human life so that this country will rise to the highest level. So a monastic order for men, a monastic order for women. And Samaji especially said, that women's monastic order will be independent of the men's monastic order. Men will not dominate over women. They will look after themselves. I don't want to commit the mistake of Buddhists and the Christians, where women were under the control of men monastics. So today they are perfectly independent, developing in their own way. So this is Swamiji's life work. Already in 1897 he landed in India. Only five years life was left. 1902 he passed away. But within that time he went to the West a second visit. Visited also Mayavati, that ashrama in the Himalayas, conducted by the saviors, Mr. and Mrs. Savior, 
and Swamiji is whom he had sent there. Now the last days have come. Swamiji's last day he is wonderful. He took a long walk, sat three hours in meditation in the temple, took a class for the Brahmacharis and Sadhus there. And by evening he went to his room, just sat in meditation. After some time, he just lay down. A young disciple was nearby. After a few minutes, Swamiji is gone. On the way the passed away. It is a tremendous event. Newspapers and all are full of this story. Sister Nivedita came from Calcutta, sat at the feet, weeping. This is the story of the Vivekananda. He said, I may die, but I will continue to work till humanity will realize that it is one with God. I shall continue to work through various agencies. Vivekananda will continue to work. That is the spirit of Swami Vivekananda. Arise, awake, and stop not till the goal is reached. One special thing he has told us. We have conducted our society based upon our smritis. Our smritis are full of discrimination against untouchables, against women, all such. Smritis cannot survive today. They cannot guide our life. Our constitution today denies many of the prescriptions of the smritis. So we should build India on our Shruti. Shruti is the Upanishad, the Vedanta. That is full of the spirit of freedom, equality, and dignity of the human personality, quality of men and women. That is what Shruti means, all the Upanishads. He wanted our people to study the Upanishads, study the Gita, the best commentary on the Upanishad, and create a new India, Indian society, based upon the Vedanta, this Advaita Vedanta, we are all essentially one. We are one with the whole world outside, not only within the nation, but also internationally as well. That is the charge he has given to us to develop each one, inspiring oneself with his own life and Ramakrishna's life and Holy Mother's life. They have all got one common characteristic, a big mother heart, full of love and compassion. Mother heart is a beautiful idea. A woman has a heart, generally compassionate, loving. She can also deliver a baby, but a man cannot deliver a baby. But man also has a mother heart. Mother heart is common to men and women. We suffered in India because the mother heart became dried up. Even our women's heart became dried up. Women have suffered more from women than from men. Remember that. Today we need to open up that mother heart of compassion, of love, the humanistic impulse, through which will come the spirit of service, elevating all humanity. This is needed all over the world, not only here. So this Advaita is preaching this type of divine humanism in the West. And it preaches that here along with various service activities as well. This is Swami Vivekananda. At the age of 39, he passed away. At the age of 29, he went to America. Only 10 years, 9 to 10 years of life, he shook up our country and the Western world as well. What a tremendous achievement for any human being. There is a wonderful shloka in the Mahabharata where the mother, queen mother, tells her princely son who became depressed due to defeat in a battle after so many persuasions, he did not become alert. And the Queen Mother said, Vidula, her name is Vidula, 
विदुला से मुहूर्तम ज्वेलितम श्रेयो न तो धूमा आई तम चिरम इट इज बेटर टू फ्लेम फोर्थ फॉर वन इंस्टेंट देन स्मोक अवे फॉर एजेस व्हाट अ ब्यूटीफुल आइडिया स्मोकिंग फॉर एजेस व्हाट फन इज देयर जस्ट फ्लेम फोर्थ एंड डिसअपीयर मुहूर्तम ज्वेलितम श्रेयो न तो धूमा आई तम चिरम दैट इज विवेकानंद दैट इज शंकराचार्य शॉर्ट लाइफ इंटेंस and it created a new awareness among the people in both in east and west swami ji's message is spreading fast all over the world by itself through books through various correspondences people come in touch and it goes on because it is so modern it is so scientific the upanishads are close to science science is close to the upanishad in fact romarola would say Vivekananda's Vedanta accepts science. Science does not accept Vedanta, because they have not understood what is Vedanta. So, a bigger circle can include a smaller circle. Vedanta is a bigger circle. Everything else is a smaller circle. It can be included in Advaita Vedanta. When you study the Upanishads properly, you will get this great understanding. Hereafter. Upanishads and the Gita will be our inspiration for building up a free, egalitarian society where human beings develop their own infinite possibilities. That is the great work for which Swami Ji came, or Sri Ram Krishna brought him for this great work. The Holy Mother belongs also to the same category, infinite Mother Heart. No distinction between Hindu, Muslim, Christian. So far, Holy Mother is concerned. He loved all of them, served all of them. Now that is the wonderful event for the modern period. Such a history has never taken place before. It is the first time a spiritual teacher deals with the economic and social problems of humanity. Formerly, they only used to deal with religion. How to meditate? How to do puja? How to go to temple? Here is a teacher who deals with economics and politics and society, all that is needed for human development through a complete philosophy of life. That is what Vivekananda got from Sri Ramakrishna: a complete philosophy of life to see God with eyes open and with eyes closed. God is here as well as there. Everywhere he is there. This is full philosophy. That is the basis of the Bhagavad Gita, and Bhagavad Gita is the essence of all the Upanishads, according to Shankara Acharya. Samasta Veda Vedartha Sahara Sangraha Bhutam Bhagavad Gita. Here is a wonderful phenomenon that has taken place in our time. We are all living in that time. We have not felt the impulse. Of that tremendous power coming from Swamiji, those who feel it, they will become great workers. They will become original, creative men and women. We have that inspiration in this country. No other country has a leadership of this type as we have in Ramakrishna and Vivekananda. We have to use that leadership. Then, what will be done? A new India will arise. And the future India is going to be brighter than all the past Indias, according to Swami Vivekananda. This is the subject which we study at this time when we are celebrating the centenary of Swamiji's wanderings all over India, and next year appearing at the Parliament of Religions also. As I said yesterday, Swamiji is what you call. But the project of life is being repeated by Kanyakumari Kendra. They have reached from Calcutta to various places up to Gujarat now. They will reach in Bombay on 20th September, 20th to 27th. They will be in Bombay, take part in all their activities, awaken the people. National awakening must come through that. This is their request to me to announce to you. Dear Kanyakumari, 
paper. Kanyakumari Kendra contains Swamiji's statue on that rock on which he meditated on this very subject and they are doing wonderful work. They have got a group of dedicated workers, even Brathis, and they work in the field of education, integrated rural development, etc., etc., in many parts of India. Yes, beginning, graduates come and join them, men and women, all. That is Kanyagumari Kendra. This is Ramakrishna Matan Mission. The other is Sharda Matan Mission. Three important institutions working out Swami Vivekananda's ideas in the best manner possible. My thanks to all of you. I take leave tomorrow to Bangalore, Mysore, Calcutta. Namaskar.